Tech Talk Tuesdays is a series of bi-weekly conversations all about engaging thought leaders, experts, researchers, and healthcare professionals in conversations around the advancements of technology and health sciences. Today's presentation is in conjunction with Arizona Forge, and we're really happy to have them. And I'm actually gonna turn the time over to Anna to do our introduction today. Thank you all so much for joining and we'll open up at the end for questions. Awesome. Thank you, Caitlin, for having me and having us here at uh, Arizona Forge. Welcome everybody who is here on uh, this spring uh, afternoon. I, was, I thought it was lunchtime. It's actually two o'clock. So uh, thank you all for uh, sharing your time with us. So yes, I am with Arizona Forge. My name is Anna Darian. Um, a little bit about Arizona Forge. Uh, I sit within the Forge at Roy Place. Um, this is the community facing program within Forge. And so I'll touch a little bit about what we do, our programs, and then I'll kick it over to Ruslan, who's going to be our speaker. Um, and he is uh, a participant of one of our programs. So Arizona Forge, sits within the uh, RII department. So research, innovation, and impact. We are, I think we're the newest department. We launched officially in 2019. And our mission fundamentally is to foster entrepreneurial mindset. We're also uh, an acronym. It's uh, finding opportunities to, uh, <laughs> I should know this by now, to grow entrepreneurs. There's an R that I'm missing there. I'll come back to it. Find, oh, finding opportunities and resources to grow entrepreneurs. There we go. Um, so what that means, entrepreneurial mindset, that could mean any number of things. Sometimes that means starting a business. Most of the time, that really just means teaching people to think through the lens of an innovator, to look at things, look at the world through, there is a problem, maybe I have a solution, and using uh, the experience of learning as you're doing as a way for you to move through this world. So this would be in opposition to say, sitting and strategizing for five years to come up with a 25 year plan that you hope that if you implement this, that maybe it'll work. You know, it's really just getting into action as soon as possible. So there's three parts of the organization. There's the Forge at UA, and this is about fostering the entrepreneurial mindset here on campus. So that's students, faculty, graduate students, um, moving beyond just thinking that uh, getting a job means doing what your boss is told, but really just growing the mindset of somebody who's going into the workplace, who's a leader and an innovator. Then there's the Forge at Roy Place. That's where I sit. This is the community facing program. Um, we are a physical location that's off campus. We are in downtown Tucson, as well as a set of programs that obviously are being uh, delivered online right now. And one of them is the Advanced Entrepreneur Program, which Ruslan took part in. So I'll talk about that in a um, just a moment. And then the third part is Forge Ahead, which is about accelerating programs, um, ventures that are further along. So these are companies that are ready for funding. Um, and this is something that we do in-house here where we work with them one-on-one -on -one in a customized way. So the advanced entrepreneur the Advanced Entrepreneur Program, it is a mouthful, um, AEP for short, I'll say that going forward. This is a, an accelerator program for early stage ventures that we offer both on campus as well as to the community at large. And this is really something that's created to uh, take ventures that are sort of post idea, meaning that they've done a certain amount of validation and they're ready to think about what does this idea look like as a business model. And so we work with faculty, students, as well as uh, startups here in the uh, Tucson area for the most part, but also beyond. And, uh, and we take everybody through everything from customer discovery to learning how to run your own board meeting. And Ruslan took part in the F20 uh, cohort, which was our third of fourth. We're going through our fourth one right now. And um, I'll let him speak about what he's working on in the venture because honestly, it's some deep, deep science that uh, you guys are gonna be really excited to hear about. I think it's a phenomenal uh, innovation for all of us. But what struck me about uh, Ruslan is obviously he's coming in from faculty and, you know, as a faculty member, you are an expert in your space, obviously. You've done all the research, you've done the work, and stepping into the space of now being an entrepreneur and running a business requires you to, to have humility in a way, right? You have to realize that you are starting over, you're learning something new, and you're going into a space that can be challenging. And Ruslan completely blew me away from day one with really embracing that, that spirit of a lifelong student um, he could have easily come in and said, this is what I'm doing. I'm an expert. This is going to work. I know it's, you know, it's a great idea, but really jumped in, did 
all the assignments, met with all the mentors and really had a spirit that I think was really valuable. And I think that there's a lot to be learned for a lot of faculty if you're stepping into the space of sort of innovator, entrepreneur, CEO and all that, um, that this is this is a different hat to be putting on. And so I'm really excited you're all getting to meet him. You're gonna learn more about his, um, his work and that's all I've got for my introduction. So Ruslan, whenever you're ready, take it away. Thank you, Anna. Uh, it was a fun time at Forge uh, for sure. And uh, I learned a lot. So I, I will share my screen right now. And um, so let me go to any switch. Okay, can you see the screen, full screen? Okay, so today uh, I'm gonna um, thank you for introduction, and it, it, it's it's a pleasure of working with you and uh, all the mentors uh, at Forge. And uh, I really attached to other companies where when we get through this uh, program. And today I'm also excited to uh, present our recent developments. So we basically start the company in June uh, 2020. So just. Uh, uh, like less than a year ago, and um, but the research was driven for like several years, six, seven years, um, and it, it's actually very interesting to see the difference when you do research and then when you try to move this research into the space where you can definitely uh, help real people and solve real problems. So, and, and that's exciting, and I want to a little bit outline what. I'm going to cover today. So I will be talking about the problems in uh, diagnostic in general. Um, I will focus on uh, my prime uh, focus, the pulmonary hypertension field. And then I will talk a little bit about precision medicine, how we deal with precision medicine, metabolic reprogramming. Then we dive deep into deep learning. I try to explain what's inside the blog book, black box. And then finally, we'll talk about our approach, uh, how we can use metabolic panels to, for diagnosis. So that's an outline. So, okay, this is a, a very staggering statistic here that uh, six out of 10 adults in US have at least one chronic disease. If you count uh, the whole population, it's a 45%. So, and the affected population continues to grow. This um, we population as population we age and we getting more and more chronic diseases. Um, many of these chronic diseases are underdiagnosed or diagnosed low, late or sometimes misdiagnosed. And late diagnosis actually reduce our chances to treat. The disease, while it's uh, in the um, uh, early stage, reversible stage, we often see patients late when this uh, decreased survival, even we, if we start treating them. So, and this, uh, why this happened actually? So uh, primary care doctors usually see patients when they come with uh, some non-specific symptoms, such as fatigue, dizziness, or dyspnea, and we did a customer discovery. It's indeed, they admitted those patients are more challenging. You could see the prevalence of symptoms in admitted patients in, in, in primary care practice. So you see the fatigue is one of the major symptoms uh, more prevalent. And the, the, why it's challenging? Because fatigue or dyspnea or chest pain could be a sign of many diseases. So each doctor have his own idea how to navigate and uh, people uh, usually get through multiple visits, see multiple specialists, uh, get the batteries of tests. In the treatment, as I said, often delayed. So we, we, we deal with people already in the developed uh, disease stage. So why I'm focusing on pulmonary hypertension because it's a really culprit of the uh, problem in diagnostics. So I little bit introduce what's going on in the pulmonary hypertension. So uh, it's still uh, unknown the, the, the reason, but um, the pulmonary circulations, um, the, all the vessels start to proliferate and all the vessel wall 
increasing in size, it's uh, include the endothelial cell proliferations, most muscle cells, and adrenal tissue proliferation. So this narrowed vessel actually increase pulmonary pressure, and this result in the increasing load on the right side of the heart. So right uh, ventricle start to pump with a more load, and it causes hypertrophy. And the people usually die from the heart, uh, right heart, uh, uh, right sided uh, uh, heart failure. So why it's um, uh, poorly diagnosed? Okay, on this schema, uh, first, you know, because our heart, right side of the heart, can um, somehow adopt this increase in pressure. First, the, this disease comes very asymptomatic. So uh, people feel nothing. When they start feeling first symptoms, it's already the decline of uh, heart function. So first decline. And they come to the doctor with, as I said, the very non-specific symptoms like dyspnea on exercise or fatigue. So it's took on average more than two years when they admit to pulmonologist, cardiologist who can do right heart catheterization. This is ultimate gold standard right now for diagnostic, very invasive procedure. But during these two years, they, they usually misdiagnosed or uh, you know, involve multiple visas. It's a lot of dollars spent. And the most important that at the um, diagnosis, they already have progressed uh, cardiac dysfunction. So and the current treatment cannot help here. So the, in the current therapeutic window. So we thought that if we can somehow uh, get the diagnosis at first symptoms, we can increase this therapeutic window. And more importantly, we can start treating this patient earlier when the cardiac function is still preserved. So this is another statistic here. So um, the functional class here, functional class two, three, and four, it's a stage of disease. So first classes are mild disease and then it, it's advanced. So as I said, at the first symptom sunset, they have all uh, class two uh, early disease, uh, pretty mild. But at the diagnosis, they already moved to stage three and four, it's very advanced disease. And here you can see that this is a median survival in years. For the class one and two, it's a six years median survival. For Class four, it's a half year median survival. So that's, you can see that how it's important to diagnose these people early and they get treatment early. Uh, how we can do it? Uh, so our goal is to use the current uh, buzzword uh, precision medicine. So what is the precision medicine? So I, you, you can find several, I think, definitions, but I like this one. Information about patient, used to prevent, diagnose, or treat disease. So we currently use some of the precision medicine because uh, our doctors, based on the, their diagnose or treatment uh, scheme on the, our records, on our family history, so we get some sort of personalized medicine. But the, the thing is, research is going so fast that we can obtain so many data about the current patients. So we can get the gen genomic data, epigenomic, transcriptomics, proteomics, and metabolomics. So all this gets to a certain phenotype of the patient, which uh, can uh, help with diagnosis or prognosis or treatment of the disease. The problem here that it's so vast uh, information that we need to navigate and make sense out of this. So uh, I will be talking today about only one layer is a metabolomic status, but it's already huge and we need a, a very nice approach to digest this information and feed it to a primary care physician to help with diagnosis. Okay, so uh, let me talk a little bit about what uh, metabolomic reprogramming means and uh, what's our metabolites. So basically uh, metabolic reprogramming came from the cancer area. And uh, it's described the transition of the cells from the normal uh, um, like uh, cell 
which is healthy to the cancer phenotype, but it can be applied to any cells actually. So metabolites are the molecules which produce in a normal function of the cells. They are base for like uh, protein synthesis, nucleic synthesis, nucleic acid synthesis, uh, uh, signal transduction, ATP for the energy, everything based on uh, the small molecules. And when the healthy cells function, they it's always produce production of these metabolites. But then when cells become sick, it produces different patterns of metabolites. So we hope we can catch this difference between normal cell and sick cells. And especially it's interestingly applied to lung, which is a very complex organ, consists of many cell types. It's a um, epithelial cells, endothelial cell, vascular cells, uh, inflammatory cells, and each disease affect um, differently each population of cells, and they change uh, metabolites accordingly to this uh, effect. And we can probably we have a hypothesis that we can distinguish these changes and distinguish different diseases. So that uh, was our hypothesis. So, and we started uh, teasing this hypothesis with the animal model. So we can induce pulmonary hypertension and look for metabolic profile. So indeed we, we did the uh, animal model and we can see on this prime, uh, principal component analysis that the metabolic changes actually um, moving from a control state once the uh, disease progressed to week one to week three, and week five, but this is an animal model. So I wanna say a little bit more about this principal component analysis because I will be talking a few slides later about this even more. So it basically each, uh, um, uh, if we study, let's say 100 metabolites, each uh, point for each animal will be in a hundred dimensional space. So we, as a human cannot process more than three dimensional, right? So we need something which can uh, project this multidimensional on the better two dimensional space. So we can see the difference. And uh, the principal component analysis actually doing the most informative projection to the two dimensional space. How to explain it? I like this uh, picture. So we see books, and they looks chaotic. But if we apply some light and project on the wall, we see some message on the wall, right? So this is the most informative projection. And we can uh, think about principal component analysis in the same way. Okay, so another model we try to catch, uh, we, we try to study metabolic changes and the changes in the pulmonary pressure in the heart. So we induced uh, in this uh, red model, pulmonary hypertension, and monitor this model for three, seven, 14 days, 28 days. And as you see here, the pulmonary pressure start to increase in early pH, uh, it's arbitrary uh, stage, early pH, but the heart is uh, still normal. In the late stage, the pulmonary pressure even increase even more, and this is the start of the heart hypertrophy. But what's, most interesting part here that metabolic changes comes much earlier than any changes in the pulmonary pressure or heart hypertrophy. And if we look at the lungs, the structure of the lungs here is uh, almost um, healthy. So, but we can already change, uh, see these changes in the metabolic profile. That was a really, um, eye-opening the discovery. So, and we decided, okay, let's see what we can get from uh, like a human blood. So can, can we get a similar result? So at this time, we already uh, studied a lot about the dysregulation in the metabolic state in, in the pulmonary hypertension, uh, how it's related to different metabolites production. And we knew, uh, the, the set of metabolites, which is really important for this dysregulation in a metabolite. So why we focused on the specific panels? Why, you know, right now, many companies can uh, tell you that they can process like hundreds, uh, thousands 
uh, of metabolites and give you uh, huge uh, untargeted panels. Um, uh, but this is a very problematic issue, I think, and this is halting the, the um, uh, discovery in, in a uh, diagnostic way. So th there is a term called curse of dimensionality. When you have a huge data set, it's actually very complex data and it's uh, not very good, uh, it's not reproducible data. So having the smaller panel get you a much better reproduce, reproduction of the data. And also it's a huge variability. So some metabolites appeared, some disappeared, and it's not really statistical sound to have the huge metabolic panels. So in our work, we actually, instead of doing untargeted way, we focus specifically on the certain panels of metabolites. As I said, the metabolites, which are base of the um, pathology of the disease. And usually they consist of 10 to 20 metabolites. When we try to do a reproducibility study, we um, obtain the blood from the pa same patient two, uh, two months apart, and they, we process this uh, two months apart on the, on the same equipment, but they were processed in a different runs uh, uh, two months away. And we get this PCA again analysis and each dot indicates same patient with uh, two months apart run. So when you can see this is most different, but most of the patients are in the same space. So it's very reproducible. I, we, we tried to do several different techniques and th that's the most uh, reproducible data we can get. Okay, so let's try to do uh, this PCA analysis for 11 metabolites we choose and try to see what will be with uh, PCA analysis of uh, healthy vessels, uh, pulmonary hypertension. And we see a very nice separation, healthy patients from pulmonary hypertension. The analysis here indicate actually 95% confidence interval. So that means if we test next uh, pH patient, 95% chances it will fall inside the circle, not outside. So it's very nicely separated. Um, but can we do actually early diagnosis? That was a main question from our um, um, research uh, on animals. So, and we obtained uh, uh, through our collaborators, uh, uh, Franz Richard and, and uh, Ken Knox, we obtained uh, samples from mild pH with the pulmonary pressure around 20 to 25 and advanced pH with a pressure over 45 millimeters. So it's interesting fact that two years ago, this patient were considered as a uh, upper limit of normal. So in, in 2019, world symposium on pulmonary hypertension decide to uh, consider uh, this patient, uh, this normal people, now uh, pulmonary hypertensive uh, people. So, so it's really early. So, and if we do our uh, PCA analysis on mild and advanced pH, we see overlap, very nice overlap between uh, metabolites. So that, that means they are indistinguishable. So they are same, cohort of patient metabolically. Uh, so we can definitely um, get the very early diagnosis for mild pH. What's also important, we, we had a treatment naive group. So this patient probably went through this uh, long uh, diagnosis uh, of pulmonary hypertension. And when they come to clinic, they were not on a therapy. So it's very important to understand if our metabolites could be affected by therapy and maybe reflecting of the, of the therapy use, not the uh, pulmonary hypertension. So we included this group and we found that therapy does not affect our results. So we see a great overlap of um, pulmonary hypertensive people on therapy and without therapy. So that's again, um, uh, point on a very important role of selecting specific panels of metabolite, which does not affect, uh, cannot be affected by 
uh, treatment. Another interesting discovery we found that if we do like untargeted uh, metabolic analysis, we found that, for example, coffee metabolites very nicely correlate with uh, pulmonary hypertension. And the reason why, uh, because people try to fight fatigue. So they, they experience fatigue, so they drink more coffee and they get this uh, coffee metabolites in the blood. But it will be not very wise to include uh, the, the coffee metabolites in, in the panel because then we will probably detect this pulmonary hypertension in the coffee drinkers. So uh, again, um, the, the primary selection of the metabolites for diagnostic is very crucial. So, okay, let me talk a little bit about artificial intelligence because um, PCA analysis is a part of this um, statistical analysis under the umbrella of uh, machine learning. So, and we wanna use machine learning more and more to get it more unbiased and uh, get more powerful of the prediction. So artificial intelligence, I took it from Oracle website, is known for many decades. Actually, it's a, a, any technique which can uh, mimic the human behavior on a computer. So it, it's known from 1950s. And recently in 80s, it was uh, you know, added uh, with a machine learning technique. Basically, it's an uh, additional set of statistical uh, uh, ways to, to um, get the, the, this um, um, technique uh, to mimic human behavior. So, and uh, recently in 2010, it was added uh, deep learning algorithms, which basically mimic how our brain works through the neural network. Okay, so let me remind how we uh, do our analysis. So we use the plasma samples uh, and we did analysis by gas chromatography mass spectrometry. We get the certain metabolites out of this in the plasma. And then we feed it into um, AI algorithm which um, classify our uh, metabolites and produce diagnostic decision. So again, I I'm, uh, I'm trying to understand as a researcher, I don't like to see like uh, you put some data in a black box and you get the results. So you, you want to understand what's going on in this black box. And I try to um, tell you how this uh, deep learning work in a several things. So, so if we, for example, want to teach machine how to discriminate between one and zero. So it, it's... Uh, let's say we, we want a program um, which can distinguish these two digits. So if I would be a programmer, I would like to see like, a, okay, if we cross this and see one black line, it will be zero, or it will be one. So if we see two uh, crossing of black line, it's a zero. Okay, it looks like it's pretty simple algorithm. So how about two? So if we do the same, probably the two will be um, considered as a zero because we cross the black line two times. Okay, we can add one more scanning. Okay, if we do two crossings, we get three crossings for two, two crossings for one, and four crossings for zero. So this is algorithm I can, um, you know, put in a computer and it will recognize this number using you know, my thinking how to solve this problem. Okay, what about deep learning? Okay, th this is a completely different. Uh, we have a one here and we have these circles, which, is, uh, which are neurons actually. So it's resemble uh, our connected neural network in the brain and they connected with a specific function. I will explain it a little bit. So we will get input here. Uh, let's say it will be a number of um, black dots in this scan. So we get this pretty similar uh, black dots. Then it will be multiplied by weights and weights could be a positive or negative number, any number. So you will get multiplication here in each arrow and it will be a sum of these uh, multiplications 
from each uh, input layer. So we will get something like that because we will apply sigmoidal function on the results of this sum because we don't want to deal with the huge numbers. So uh, this sigmoid function will transfer like uh, transform the uh, large positive number close to one, large negative numbers close to zero and something in between. So it will be from zero to one. Okay, so if we apply this multipliers and we do it in many layers and those uh, multipliers players will be random, we'll end up probably with 30% recognized as a one, 30% as a zero and 30% as a two. So it doesn't help, but we can tell the computer that this is actually one. We knew this is one. So it should ad adjust all these multipliers in that way that it will end up with uh, more probability here and less probability here. Okay, it will be like something like that. So it will um, uh, induce some uh, um, large numbers and it will end up in a, in, in a large numbers here, more probable result uh, at one. So same, we will be applied for, we will apply for the zero and same for the two. But the trick here, we will not uh, we will try not to change our result for one when we train the system for zero, and we will not change one and zero when we train the system for two. It, it's a huge uh, computer power, and until recently, it will be not possible to do. But it, it, right now, it's possible, and at this point, we can recognize numbers and what's important to my previous um, example that we we didn't teach we didn't teach the computer how to do it so it figured out itself by adjusting these multipliers that's a power of this machine learning it's self-taught so in our case we will not put here the number uh, the dots but we will put the metabolites level. So if it's increasing, we will, uh, and we will apply like 11 metabolites and we will train the system if this is a healthy patient with such a, a number of uh, metabolites or this is a pulmonary hypertensive uh, patient. So, and we did it and um, that's represent our results. It's this uh, matrix called the confusion matrix. So we can read it very easily. So we have actual healthy patient 12 and actual pH patient 34. Uh, and uh, our actual healthy patient recognized, predicted as a healthy and zero predicted as a pH. As, and here our pH patient, zero predicted as healthy and 34 predicted as pH. So it's a hundred percent success. So we, feed with our metabolites and the machine told us what's, who is a healthy, who is a, uh, a pH person. But we trained actually this machine and we use the cross validation technique because our um, sample size is small. We use certain part, let's say 25% for um, validation, for, for testing and 75% uh, for training. And then we switch uh, to the next um, data set, to next data set, to next data set, and we combine. But here is anyway 100% success. So uh, it, it's a great algorithm, but it's not really uh, helpful in a diagnostic way because if you think the pulmonary hypertension, it's pretty rare disease. If person will come to the doctor with, uh, you know, a fatigue, uh, it's hardly imagined that it will be uh, tested for pulmonary hypertension. So we decided to see if this panel can be applied also to other conditions with a similar symptoms. Let's say diabetes, uh, people have fatigue, left heart disease, we include uh, specifically left heart disease because um, the pH is a right heart problem. Uh, uh, but most people are affected by the left heart problem. So, and there is no way how we can discriminate left heart from 
right hard using current um, uh, biomarkers because all these problems comes from the failing heart and it's similar fail if it's left heart or right heart. So we did a similar type of uh, machine learning analysis and we distinguish our pulmonary hypertension patient from the left heart disease and for, from the uh, diabetics, uh, again, with 100% success. There is a, some confusion happened when some patients with diabetes were recognized as a heart patients. But then when we look at the records, we found that uh, those diabetic patients had actually uh, heart problems. So it's really demonstrate the, the power of, of this analysis because we can um, find this uh, a heart problem in, in the diabetics as well with the same uh, set of metabolites. But then we start to think, is this like a gold uh, start, uh, gold um, set of metabolites? We can distinguish all the diseases and we found that it's not the case. So it's very nice, this uh, first panel we come up with distinguishing healthy people from diabetic people, from heart, lung, uh, from cancers. But if you wanna distinguish even more, like is it a pulmonary hypertension or this is a pulmonary fibrosis or COPD, this panel doesn't work. So we come up with an idea to use tiered uh, AI analysis when we use one panel to separate it by organs, and then subphenotype it more deeply using different algorithms and different panels for each particular, uh, you know, affected uh, cells or uh, organs. So, and we indeed we were successful when we combine all these panels. We can uh, successfully um, separate healthy people from pulmonary hypertension from other respiratory diseases like COPD and ILD. And three, we tried three different cancers and we get a very nice separation. So right now we start working on the uh, uh, idea of doing not a multi-class um, uh, machine learning when we attach each individual different diseases, but uh, it's a real world situation when one patient could have several diseases, let's say diabetes and pulmonary hypertension. So uh, this is called multi-label uh, classification. So we, we can actually uh, put several comorbidities and test if indeed our metabolic panels can predict the, this uh, real life situation. That's our like a future um, uh, forwarding uh, discovery. So, and uh, I wanna finally illustrate that um, not only diagnostic field can, uh, uh, can be, uh, you know, advanced by this technology, but also prognostic field. So everybody knows right now what RDS means. Uh, the, um, I will just talk a little bit. Uh, RDS, it's an acute respiratory distress syndrome. It's, it's a deadly condition and usually happen when you have viral infection like a COVID or you have the pneumonia, bacterial infection, or it's a systemic inflammation like sepsis. Our vessels in the lung become more, um, uh, you know, uh, the, the biofluid can get through the blood vessels and actually fill our lung volume. So we, have, we experienced hypoxemia and uh, it's really deadly because 50% admitted patients die from this RDS syndrome. So we were lucky to get some samples when people admit, just admitted to ICU. They usually spend seven to like one, two weeks in the ICU. And you know, this 50% mortality basically tells that there is a 50% chances for the patient to be alive or dead. So we did the similar analysis how we have done it for uh, diagnostic decision. And, but in this case, we train the system to predict dead or alive outcome. Uh, and remember the, this, um, the, the 
blood was collected at day zero at admittance. So, and you see the power of this analysis that the, the, uh, this algorithm can predict um, who will be dead actually in 95% of the cases. So it's very important. I think if we can uh, tell to clinicians on what population to focus who are admitted to ICU, who needs more you know, um, uh, supportive uh, care and the uh, um, extra input, so it can change the situation and we can get, I'm sorry, uh, not a 50% mortality, but hopefully it will decrease. So that's again, um, underline the uh, very importance, very great importance of this approach. Okay, so let me just finish with uh, some of our achievements. So our team uh, get the, uh, uh, through the, uh, uh, was selected as a finalist of uh, governance celebration of innovation award. We got the customer discovery grant from NSF. Uh, we got two asset developments grant from uh, grants from uh, TLA uh, for the uh, you know getting more samples uh, tested, and and we also did a regulatory uh, recently a, a, a asset development. We also um, uh, because uh, <laughs> we were in the forge, so we get through the advanced entrepreneur program. With Anna, and we right now semi finalist of the idea finding. So the final will be on April 15. And we just recently received the translational seed grant from the Flynn Foundation. And let me introduce our team. So our team consists of uh, some scientific founders myself, Olga, uh, Alex, and we recently, uh, the uh, Martin Fuchs. Uh, join our team as a CEO, and we all bring the expertise on the table. So I'm expert in metabolomics, Olga in uh, translational studies, Alex in uh, machine learning algorithms, and uh, uh, Martin is a great expert in the industry uh, of uh, diagnostics. So we have a clinical advisors, uh, Franz Duchard and uh, Ken Knox, and we have also mentors and advisors from TLA, and we have also uh, Patrick uh, from 3M. He was a mentor in our NSF uh, customer discovery. And thank you. Thank you so much. So we do have some time for questions. Um, please feel free to submit via the chat or jump in. I got one in advance of your talk, though, that was emailed to me, and it asks, if you have any advice for faculty who want to reach out to Forge, if you could give them one piece of advice or share something about your journey with Forge, what would it be? Uh, yeah, so uh, the, as I understand, maybe Anna will correct me, the Forge working with uh, the um, ideas which already get through the first uh, validation step. So it, it's validated then. Just uh, email to Anna and, and have a chat with her. I think that that's a, a very simple advice. <laughs> Anna, can you correct me or? Yeah, I mean, I'm gonna assume this was maybe a faculty question. I would say, first of all, if it is a faculty, step one is absolutely connecting with Tech Launch Arizona. It's a phenomenal resource that you should always be connected to. Um, but yes, if you are, wanting to find out more about really transforming that idea into a business. Um, we do have services for you, but Tech Launch is your home. Don't <laughs> go there. Yes, I agree. And it's a great, um, you know, um, I, I did several patents in different uh, universities and I think TLA is a great place here. They, they uh, coach you in all the, you know, possible aspects. Mm -hmm. And they also have the i program that they run periodically um, that helps you a lot with the customer discovery because step one of validating your idea is to talk to other people, for sure. 
talk to me too, but talk to your customers. <laughs> I would also jump in that um, for any faculty, this particular faculty that emailed me wasn't with UAHS, but for UAHS faculty, we also have a great research admin um, up on the ninth floor and they are happy to coordinate any of those steps to tell you who at TLA to reach out to and to kind of help you put everything together so that when you do have this great idea and you're starting your research, you can present it the best way possible as you move forward. Um, I do want to give a chance. Does anybody else have any other questions before we wrap up today's session? All right, perfect. Well, Anna, Ruslan, thank you so much for your time today. Uh, thank you for your presentation and thank you to all the work that both of you are doing. Um, again, today's session will be recorded and posted on the UAHS YouTube and for everybody that registered for the talk, we'll send out a link. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Have a great rest of your day, everyone.